Hey crazies! In our last video about light, we talked a little bit about fusion, and I said this. Every four protons comes together to make one helium nucleus. But four protons have more mass than one helium nucleus. Then people started asking questions in the comments, and I was like, why don't we just make a video about it? So let's do it! First, when we say fusion, we specifically mean nuclear fusion, as in the nucleus of an atom. Originally, the word nucleus meant the kernel at the center of a nut. But we've since made it mean the center of anything small. Big things have a core, small things have a nucleus. It's that simple. Yeah, but what's fusion? All right, I guess I kind of skipped that, didn't I? Fusion means to combine multiple things into one thing. With nuclear fusion, smaller atomic nuclei combine to form larger ones. Usually this happens in the core of a star, but it did happen a little in the early universe. It can also happen in hydrogen bombs and fusion reactors. Basically anywhere with similar conditions to the core of a star. So what kind of stuff can we make? That depends on what you're combining. The sun is fusing hydrogen into helium, which shouldn't be that surprising since the sun is mostly hydrogen. Then again, so is the regular matter in the universe. Just to be clear though, when we say hydrogen, we don't mean a hydrogen gas molecule or a hydrogen atom. We mean a hydrogen nucleus. It's so hot inside the sun, the hydrogen can't hold on to its electrons anymore. I'm free! It's just a bunch of electrons and protons zipping around freely. We call this a plasma. Oh, oh, like the stuff in my blood? No, that's biology. This is physics. Totally different things. Anyway, those protons are still called ionized hydrogen, or H+, which as you can imagine leads to all sorts of confusion. Just keep in mind, for the rest of the video, whenever I refer to something on the periodic table, I only mean its nucleus. Okay, so why doesn't fusion just happen everywhere? Ooh, good question. You can slap neutral atoms together all day, but atomic nuclei are charged. And similar charges don't like to be near each other. Whether you're talking giant uranium, middleest iron, or little tiny hydrogen, all nuclei carry a positive charge, which will repel other positive charges. It's called the Coulomb barrier. And you need a really strong force to overcome it. Like, oh, I don't know, maybe gravity? The sun has a lot of that to spare. I mean, it does contain 99.8% of the solar system's mass. A lot of mass means a lot of gravity. So the sun, a giant cloud of mostly protons, uses its own gravity to force those protons together. Hulk smash. Doesn't helium have neutrons in it though? I was wondering how long it was going to take you to ask about that. So yeah, confession time. While the idea of nuclear fusion is simple, the actual processes are not. Which is pretty typical of real life now that I think about it. Anyway, before we get into the details, there are some things you should know. First, during all nuclear reactions, energy, momentum, and charge are all conserved. Rest mass is not conserved, but it is a type of energy, so it's accounted for that way. We'll call it rest energy for the remainder of the video. Second, neutrons can decay into protons whenever they want, because neutrons have more rest energy than protons. It doesn't happen a lot, otherwise there wouldn't be any neutrons, but it does happen. Third, protons can decay into neutrons, but only with a little help. That extra rest energy has to come from somewhere, usually the kinetic energy lost during the collision with another particle. And finally, fourth, remember that protons don't like to be together, but neutrons can help keep them together. Near the top of the periodic table, the number of each is pretty even, but as you move down the table, you need more neutrons than protons. All right, now we're ready for some nuclear reactions. We said before, hydrogen fusion turns four protons into one helium and some light, but some of that light comes from anti matter annihilations with electrons. There are also a couple of neutrinos that get made, cause why not? And this whole process can happen a couple of different ways. The proton-proton chain adds protons one at a time, creating neutrons along the way through decay and releasing light and neutrinos that zip out of the sun. The CNO cycle releases all the same light and neutrinos, but uses carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen along the way to build helium. Either way, the sun will eventually run low on hydrogen, forcing it to fuse helium into carbon, which it will do using the triple alpha process. In case you're wondering, sometimes helium nuclei are called alpha particles, and it takes three of them to make one carbon. Hence, triple alpha. Even after you get the temperature right, a lot of other stuff still has to go a certain way. If you smash two protons together and neither one of them decays into a neutron, then they just fall back apart. If you smash two heliums together, the third one better get there soon, or the first two will just fall back apart. If you want to make even bigger nuclei, it just gets even more difficult. 
The bigger a nucleus is, the more it wants to repel other nuclei. Sometimes you can get the core of the star hot enough for that, but other times you have to sneak in a neutron and wait for it to decay into a proton. It's called neutron capture, and it can happen either slowly or rapidly. The point is, making all the elements on the periodic table is harder than it sounds. But if we figure it out, we've got a great source of clean energy. So are you excited about the future of fusion power? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for liking and sharing this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with us. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. In the last video, we learned how to properly calculate orders of magnitude. Come at response time! Liam De Los Salses was wondering exactly how Enrico Fermi made his original estimate for the blast power of that nuke. Well, we don't know exactly. A Fermi estimate is sometimes called a back of the envelope estimate, because it's like something you would jot down on the back of a used envelope. Unfortunately, Fermi was so good at this, he never actually wrote it down. Some people have tried to guess what he did, though. Links to the doobly-doo. SML Strength said he learned more about logs in four minutes than he did in two semesters at school. School. I'm glad I was able to help, and that's awesome. I also agree that school kind of sucks a lot of the time, at least in the US. But I think that's just encouragement to try to make school better. So it's more like the current model of school. Andy Kirkham, nice one with the resistor color bands. I totally approve. For those of you looking for other Fermi estimates, Elliot Gray suggested one from the XKCD What If series. If you haven't noticed, the book is on my shelf. Link in the doobly-doo. Thank you so much for all the encouragement. We've got a great lineup of videos planned for the next few months. Oh, that reminds me! Every December, I usually do a three-video series because I have extra time. But I want to switch gears this year. There are a few topics I haven't covered because they require more than five minutes and you can't really divide it up. So rather than a series, I'd like to make a longer video instead. Just something to look forward to. See you next time!